Well, Dr. Brooks, welcome to the UK. Thank you, thanks for having me here. Well, thank you, and, and, and welcome to the Adam Smith Institute, who are who is kindly uh, uh, hosting our event uh, tonight. So what, what do you hope to accomplish uh, on your visit to the UK? Well, really, what I'm hoping is to, to increase the exposure of Ayn Rand in the UK. I mean, Ayn Rand has never really sold, her books have never really sold very well here. Um, her influence has been, I think, fairly marginal uh, in the UK, and yet I think her ideas are so important and so valuable uh, to both intellectuals here, to the, the students, you know, I'm going to Oxford uh, tomorrow and the day after. Uh, the idea is to try to increase the visibility of, uh, of Ayn Rand and her, idea, her ideas, both to kind of the, those activists who are involved in defending capitalism on a regular basis, and to the young student population. And that kind of uh, addresses my second question as well, which is what you see as the most important ways to promote Ayn Rand's ideas in the UK. I mean, you mentioned the universities there, you mentioned... Well, the yeah, I mean, first and foremost, what we do in the US is we're really focused on young people. We're really focused on uh, high school kids and, and on the universities. And I think that that needs to be translated here. People go through a period in their lives, probably between 16 and 25, when they're open to new ideas and they're, and they're willing to accept new radical ideas. And I think we need to capture, uh, get people to read the books at that point in their life. And the more uh, books we can get into the hands of students, the greater success we will have. And then secondly, um, as I mentioned, I mean, there are some really, uh, there's some really smart people working in a variety of different think tanks here in, in Great Britain uh, on issues surrounding capitalism, free markets, and so on. Uh, what I'd like to, to help them do is, is, is bringing Ayn Rand's unique defense of capitalism to the forefront because I think that without, as I'll talk about tonight, without that defense of capitalism uh, from a moral perspective, uh, it's very difficult to, to argue the case for capitalism and to win. Um, I think that uh, from an economic perspective, after all, we've won the debate, capitalism works. Uh, and we'll, you know, we, we can talk about the current financial crisis, but, but I, I, think, I think the economic problems were solved a long time ago by by people like Hayek and Von Mises and to some extent Milton Friedman. Um, the real case that needs to be in for capitalism is a moral one, and that's I'm hoping to bring that kind of to uh, to the UK uh, think tank and intellectual intellectual environment. Great. Well, uh, th thanks for all your efforts. Uh, so well, on to current affairs then, and the, the, the topic of your yeah. talk tonight. So you know, obviously we were right in the middle of this huge financial crisis, it's absolutely in full swing. We've got serious voices now calling for the nationalization of all banks in America. Uh, you know, these are tough times to be a defender of free markets, a yep. defender of capitalism, of private enterprise. Uh, so, you know, how do you answer those voices all around the culture today who say that the free market has failed? I guess I ask them what they're talking about, because, uh, I mean, the notion that free markets have failed is bizarre. Uh, what free markets is what I what I ask them. Uh, where have you seen free markets? Uh, if free markets mean that the government is not interfering in the economy, if free markets mean that people are left to voluntarily deal with one another, trade, exchange, based on uh, on contracts, based on mutual voluntary agreements, then we have no free market. Uh, something has failed, but it certainly isn't that. If you look at the United States, which is I'm, I'm much more familiar with than, than the UK, uh, the two industries that are most affected by this crisis, the housing market and the financial markets, are some of the most regulated, controlled markets uh, anyway. The housing markets, I could go through a whole list of, of uh, various regulations that the government, government, the US government has housing policy, as does the UK government. But in, in, in the US, it takes the form of anywhere from the fact that your mortgage is interest deductible. So if you take out a big mortgage, you can deduct the interest. If you rent, you can't deduct your rent. So in a sense, what you've got is a situation in the U.S. where the renters are subsidizing homeowners and people who've paid off their mortgages are subsidizing people who have mortgages. So that's not free. That is a government incentive to, own a, to take out a mortgage, not just to own a home, but to take out a mortgage. These mortgages are subsidized, particularly uh, mortgages for low-income uh, individuals. Uh, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, uh, these two institutions that together, as of 2007, owned about 50% of all the mortgages in the U.S. in some form or another back those mortgages. They were basically government entities, and they were able to provide to, to buy these mortgages and provide very low interest rates because of a government subsidy. Uh, the government was guaranteeing their debt. 
Um, Freddie and Fannie have a huge responsibility for the crisis that we're in today. Um, but housing policy in the U.S. goes beyond that. There's something called the Community Reinvestment Act, where Congress over the years has encouraged banks to lend to low-income people. What does that mean? The lending to low-income people means high-risk loans, means subprime loans. Subprime loans, surprise, surprise, are the core of this crisis. So there's the Community Reinvestment Act, the, the federal bank home loan. I mean, there's so many government entities. And that's just on the mortgage side. Then if you go to the actual building side, and this is something that is common with the UK, think of all the zoning, the environmental restrictions, the green belts, they restrict the supply of homes. So in the United States, in places like San Francisco and the Bay Area and Southern California where I live, there's very limited supply of where you can actually build homes. That's free, that's not a free market. The, the government telling me whether I can build on my land or not, that's not freedom. The government owning so much of the land, uh, most people don't know this, but 75% of all the land west of the Mississippi in the United States is owned by either federal, state, or local governments. That's not free, that's not capitalism. Um, and then if you go to the banking sector, banks in the United States are among the most regulated industries in the world. Every aspect of the banking industry is regulated, from deposit insurance, which basically says that uh, you shouldn't care which bank you give your money to as a depositor because it's guaranteed by the government up to $250,000 right now, uh, which provides pretty perverse incentives to bankers to take on risk that otherwise they wouldn't. Uh, two, uh, banks are controlled in terms of how much capital they should take. They're controlled in terms of uh, what loans they could make. Uh, every uh, Interest rates are, of course, controlled by, by the Federal Reserve. So every aspect of the banking industry is controlled by government. So again, what free market, I ask you? What capitalism has failed? And then lastly, but mainly, in, in a sense, most importantly, the very existence of a Federal Reserve, or in the UK, the Bank of England, is, is, is a perversion. Um, here we have a, a government entity controlling interest rates, controlling the supply of money. Again, why not let markets determine interest rates? Why not let markets determine the supply of money? And the Federal Reserve and the Bank of England uh, have such reach into every aspect of the economy that, again, the question has to be, what capitalism, what, uh, you know, what free markets? What we can say unequivocally is this. The mixed economy, the regulatory, regulated economy, so the mixture of socialism and capitalism and the heavy regulation, that has failed. And now it's important to figure out what actually caused the crisis and get rid of that, as I think it turns out. What really caused the crisis is government intervention, and that's what we need to get rid of. You, you've made a case there that it's the mixed economy that's failed rather than free markets. But even in the best of times, bankers and businessmen operate under this cloud of moral suspicion. Absolutely. Um, and in, in this crisis, there are all sorts of, uh, of alleged misdeeds that people point to. You know, the topical ones at the moment are the, uh, the claiming of bonuses from uh, nationalized or partially nationalized or at least uh, failing uh, banks you know there, there was this big uh, fuss about John Thane with his this massive uh, bonus, refurbishment yeah. of his office and, yeah. and his bonus and so on is is there is there really no case to say that that uh, the, the the bankers and the businessmen have done something wrong here even if the fundamental cause is is the government well, first of all, I find it really uh, amazing that the bankers are at fault again. Um, I think that in the last thousand years, probably every economic crisis that has hit the West was blamed on the bankers. And I think there's a reason for that. I don't think it's accidental that bankers always get the blame. Uh, and, and there are really two issues here. One is there's a long-standing tradition in the West that's anti-usury. And, and most people don't realize but usury really used to mean interest of any form. So there has been a, tra a traditional suspicion of any kind of interest-taking uh, entity, uh, banks, investment banks, uh, um, all kind of financial activity has always been viewed with suspicion. And that goes back to the ancient Greeks and certainly Christianity in the Middle Ages picked up on this uh, heavily. Uh, you know, I think part of the roots of anti-Semitism have to do with the fact that Jews were the usurers in the Middle Ages, because it was it was prohibited on Christians to do it, because it was a mortal sin. I think Dante puts the users in the seventh rung of hell. Um, 
so there's a sudden, uh, you know, sudden bias against this idea of usury, this against this idea of making money off of money. And I think one of the origins of that, which is, which is, I think, the second cause, is this: is the idea that look, business is inherently self-interested. Businessmen go into the office every day to make money, make money for themselves, for their shareholders, for their employees. Uh, they don't go into the offices every day uh, thinking about how they can maximize the well-being of the public, of society, of the common good. And yet, we as a culture believe that morally, the standard of virtue is the common good. So if I say in a culture we live in today, this is in the public interest, everybody goes, oh, you know, that's a good thing. But if I go out and say, I'm doing this to maximize my profits, immediately, I am, you know, I am uh, perceived as, as, as something negative, uh, amoral at best, usually immoral. Many businessmen, can hide behind a product. So when Bill Gates makes a lot of money, he can say, look, here's a piece of software. You guys have all benefited from this software. I did it for you. you know, I don't think he actually says that, but he could. And people see that, people get it. I got this benefit from this piece of software or from this furniture or from you know, making a movie. And why do actors make so much money? Well, I got entertained by the actors, so that's acceptable. Bankers, on the other hand, do something that's very hard for people to comprehend. They make our lives much more meaningful and valuable in numerous, numerous ways. But all these ways are very difficult to explain. It's hard for them to hide. They are greedy on the face of it. They're self-interested on the face of it. And it, it's very hard for them to hide behind any kind of product that they produce. So when we see bankers, we immediately think greed. We immediately think self-interest. And I would say, yes, that's true. And that's a good thing. This is Ayn Rand's innovation, that, that, that self-interest is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. Yes, that's virtuous. Making a profit is a virtuous thing. It's not a bad thing. But in the popular culture, making a profit is a bad thing because it's not in the public, so-called public interest. So bankers always get accused of these kind of crises. Businessmen always get accused of these kind of crises because they're self-interested. And in our culture, self-interest is viewed negatively. With regard to the particulars uh, of this crisis, certainly there were some bankers who did things that were fraud, and they should go to jail if they committed fraud. Anybody who, you know, steals, or cheats, or you know, deceives other people should be punished. But I think the number of, of, of truly fraudulent businessmen is, is relatively small, and the ones that did commit it should be caught and, and put in jail. Um, other businessmen did a lot of stupid things. Bankers did some dumb things. But what's interesting is that there are circumstances that are created. And, and the Austrian economists talk about this quite extensively when they talk about the business cycle. When the Federal Reserve or the Bank of England flood the markets with credit, it is very easy for bankers to then mistake this basically inflationary money out of nowhere with real wealth, and to make decisions that after the fact look completely irrational and silly, but while you're in the midst of it, look completely reasonable. And I think that's what happened with this crisis. A lot of the decisions these bankers were making were being made, it seemed reasonable when they made it. And not only that, not making the decisions often led your competitor to take a lot of market share from you. And just to stay competitive, you had to issue certain type of mortgages that today we look back and say, that was dumb. Why would you ever want to, you know, issue these kind of mortgages without checking people's backgrounds and or, or without getting their income there? Well, your competitors were all doing that, and they were doing it because they could basically raise money for almost nothing from the Federal Reserve because interest rates are so low. So they were willing to take on enormous risk because money was so cheap. So the origins of this problem really have go back to the cheap credit policies of the Federal Reserve. And yes, bankers made dumb decisions after that. Um, with regard to the specifics of bonuses and, and, and offices, look, the problem here is not that bonuses were paid. You know, if bonuses, if excess bonuses were being paid, if people were making more money than they deserved, whose problem is that? Well, in enormous circumstances, it's the problem of shareholders. I don't really care. As long as I don't own shares in um, you know, Merrill Lynch, I don't care how much the CEO makes. 
because the money he makes is coming out of shareholders' pockets. If they don't care, why should I care? The problem has become now that the U.S. government has put, or the British government has put money, taxpayer money, into these banks. Now it's a tricky situation. Who owns the bank? Who are the shareholders? Are taxpayers the shareholders? Now taxpayers care. But the solution to that is not penalize bankers with their bonuses. The solution to that is get the government out of these banks. The government has no business owning any kind of business enterprise. They certainly shouldn't be owning any banks. Um, if they are now going to be in a position to decide people's bonuses, people's salaries, you know, next I want to decide loan, who to give loans to and who not to give loans to, how to run a bank, they can barely do a semi-awful job at running the government, which is, I think, a relatively simple function. Banking is much more complicated than anything they do at, at uh, what is it, Whitehall, uh, or anything they do from the White House. Banking is far more complicated, in my view, than being the president of the United States. I don't want a bunch of bureaucrats now making those kind of decisions. Bankers make mistakes. Who suffers? Their shareholders do. Their bondholders do. And that's fine. Let them go bust. Let them go bankrupt. Once you get the government involved, bankers make mistakes. We all suffer. That is the problem. The problem is the involvement of the government in the banking sector. Uh, there is no right solution, in my view. If the government owns shares in a bank, I don't know what the bonus should be. I don't know what salary should be. There is There are no shareholders at that point. Uh, the government certainly is not in a position to dictate these things, but they have to because they own, they own the shares. Um, the solution is to get them out of business. So there should be... You know, the government's function is not to run businesses, it's to protect individual rights. That is the only purpose of government, the protection of individual rights. No individual rights are served by the government getting involved in the banking industry. Thank you. And very clearly, what, what uh, President Obama is doing now stands in fairly stark, stark contrast to what you're saying. You know, we have this $900 billion stimulus package. Um, which which he's proposing, which he says is absolutely vital, sure. and without which sure. there's going to be a disaster. People talk about deflation and a, a, you know another another great depression. Um, what what do you think of of? Okay, it's very clear what you think of that response. But what what do you think is the? Why do you think that's wrong? And what what, what do you think is the, is is the right response to this? Well, let me first first of all maybe defend Obama and say. Um, Obama is no worse than Bush was, so this is not a Democrat versus Republican thing. And it, even if you look at the, at the Republicans in, in Congress, uh, all their entire objection to the stimulus plan has been, we don't want $900 billion, we want 8 or 7 or 6 they're, they're debating the numbers. When the whole notion of stimulus bill is, is ridiculous. The, the idea that you can somehow get the economy going by, in a sense, taking money from some people and giving it to other people is ludicrous. Um, where does this money come from? Where does an $800 billion that they're going to approve or maybe have approved already uh, come from? Well, they have to borrow. In other words, they're taking money from the private sector, from people who have savings, and they're going to take that money away, and then they're going to decide how to distribute it. Government is not very good at making uh, those kind of capital investment decisions. The private markets are much better. So what we're doing is we're sucking $800, million, $800 billion, this is the number is staggering, $800 billion out of the private economy, savings of people, and then we're handing it to a bunch of bureaucrats to distribute to their favorite causes, which is basically what's going to happen. Um, to imagine that that has a positive impact on the economy is just absurd. The $800 billion in the private hands is not sitting in somebody's mattress unused. It's sitting in banks that are lending that money. It's sitting in private equity funds. It would go into hedge funds. It would go into real investments in the economy. All those, all that money would be invested in some way or another in the economy if the government didn't stimulate. It didn't use this $800 billion supposedly to stimulate. Um, I would actually argue that, and, and by the way, this has never worked. So FDR tried this during the Great Depression. Uh, spent uh, at that time in probably equivalent dollars today, he spent about $500 billion, and that didn't help the economy. Uh, the, the U.S. economy was as bad in '39 when World War II started as it was in '33 when, when FDR took office. Unemployment was still double digits in, in, in '39. Nothing had really happened economically from all that money being thrown at it. Um, and Japan, of course, tried this in the 1990s, and this, they, they went through what's called the lost decade. 
Nothing happened in their economy in spite of the government spending hundreds of billions of dollars on infrastructure projects and so-called stimuli. Uh, I would actually argue the exact opposite. If you want to stimulate the US economy, the best thing to do is cut government spending. Stop government borrowing. If the government borrows less money, that frees up more money for individuals and savers and institutions that are private to make investments in the real economy. It would reinforce the market mechanisms that are already at work trying to recover from, from you know, the disaster of the last uh, year or so. Get the government out of banking. Get the government out of housing policy. If you want to do anything, cut corporate income tax, cut the capital gains taxes, cut income taxes. But don't, um, don't increase your debt load, debt that you can't pay off. The only way to pay off this debt is by printing money, which causes inflation. So the long-term consequence of this so-called stimulus plan is inflation. Um, instead of that, what you want is to get government out of the economy. You want to get governments um, out of regulating the banks to, you know, in the way they do, out of regulating home ownership, and cut government expenditures dramatically. That will really, I mean, if, if, if Obama was cutting $800 billion from the U.S. budget right now, the, the economy would boom, which is completely counterintuitive for most people. But the more government takes, the bigger chunk the government takes, the slower economic growth is going. So that there's, there's no case, in your view, for government action to halt the fall in uh, the supply of money and credit? I think there is. So, I mean, you've got a problem. Once the Federal Reserve becomes the land of last resort, once the Federal Reserve is responsible for the monetary system, it has to do something when, when uh, money and credit collapse. And I think the Federal Reserve, by increasing you know, the money supply and by buying some of, these, some of the debt and by lowering interest rate, it's probably doing what it should do given the fact that that's its responsibility. Now, I would argue there should be a Federal Reserve to begin with. We should have a private banking gold standard and let private bankers deal with it. And then you don't get these widespread depressions. What you get is maybe localized issues, but you don't get systemic risk the way you do right now. But, put, but other than the Fed, the government should have no role in this crisis. It, it shouldn't be bailing out banks. The Treasury shouldn't be bailing out anybody. They should let. They should have let Bistons collapse. They should have let AIG collapse. Um, the federal, the Fed's job was is to, to continue to provide liquidity into the market as these things are happening, and it's done that. You know whether it's done well or not. I think we will know in a few years when we look back at the data and see and see how well they performed. It's an impossible job. So the Federal Reserve almost never does a good job. It, or it either undershoots or overshoots. Because there is no market mechanism to tell them where the where the price where the right price is, um, so you, you you know I don't know exactly what they're doing wrong, but I can almost guarantee what they're doing is wrong. Uh, but other than the Federal Reserve, there should be no government intervention in the economy. Uh, just leave it alone. Let the market sort this out, uh, and ideally extract yourself out of the, uh, as I mentioned, extract this, the government should be extracting itself out of the economy, extracting itself out of regulations, extracting itself out of spending all this money, um, private capital in, into the economy. Last question, slightly more generally than just, just economics, obviously President Obama's just taken office. Uh, what, what do you think more generally of, of the start of his term of, of office and what, what, what kind of cultural uh, and changes do you think um, that that will bring to the to the U.S. over the next four years. Well, I mean, I think it's going to be interesting to see. It's not exactly clear, I think, yet what those changes are going to be. He's he's come in with an unspecified agenda, an agenda of change, without specifying any of the content of that change. Um, a lot of his nominations so far have been kind of centrist nominations, but I I suspect he is going to govern from the left of his advisors. He's going to be pushing them uh, leftwards. I think that you're already seeing a greater suspicion of markets, uh, greater disrespect for capitalism, uh, greater humility when it comes to uh, American humility when it comes to uh, its uh, its values and when it comes to foreign policy. Uh, and I think you're generally going to see a shift to the left. Um, now, granted, that shift started with Bush. Uh, I don't like letting Bush off the hook here because uh, Bush is, to a large extent, is responsible for the shift to the left. The Republicans in Congress spent money like, uh, like, like.
like they were socialists, never mind Democrats. Uh, Bush increased regulations of American business like uh, almost no other president in, in decades. Uh, sarbanes oxley being the obvious example, but, but many other uh, forms of regulation. Uh, so government involvement in the economy has grown under Republican administration. It's continuing now with Obama. It's going to be it's going to be interesting to see uh, what kind of impact I think the overall that has a negative impact on the economy and its ability to recover. I think the US economy will recover, but I think it'll be very slow and very painful and very volatile. I think we're in for probably a decade of, of very volatile uh, economic uh, news coming out of the of the US. We might see a recovery, but then you know another probably another recession following that. Um, I think what we're really setting ourselves up for uh, with Obama is, uh, you know, whether it's in four years, probably not, but maybe in eight to 12 years, another swing to the right. The American people, I don't think, will tolerate a permanent shift leftwards. Um, the real question is going to be for America is what kind of shift to the right that it is. Is that going to be a shift to the right towards um, more of the kind of religious conservatism? Uh, that has dominated the Republican Party now uh, since the 1980s, or is it going to be towards free market principles? That, I think, is the battle of the next decade. Um, because this shift to the right is going to have a permanent impact on American culture. Uh, I think, ultimately, the right is going to have more impact on America than the left does. Uh, and if, the, if it's religious right, then, uh, you know, then it's doom and gloom. I'm very pessimistic about the ability of the U.S. to recover from, from that. Uh, and it, right now, that's the direction the Republican Party is heading. But if you think of the religious conservatives, um, they do not believe in free markets. And uh, they certainly don't believe in, in freedom um, in our personal lives. They want to control our economic life and want to control our personal lives. They, they, are, they are more inclined towards fascism than, than even the left is. And therefore, I think they are ultimately, long-term, the greatest threat to, to, to American liberty uh, that exists. What the real challenge is going to be over the next decade is to establish, reinforce, and fight for a right that is pro-free markets, that is that leaves individuals alone, both in, the, both in the economic life and in the private life, that leaves religion out of politics, uh, but really is pro-markets and pro-capitalism. And uh, that's going to be a real struggle. And we're starting off uh, at the deficit. This is, this is not going to be easy. The, the, both the left and the religious right are far more powerful than the pro-free market right is. But, you know, the, the job is going to be to try to change that.